Well, this is a cask I made a while back. This is white oak. Um, this flag in here is white oak. Um, but depending on where the coopers were and what was what was growing nearby of a particular quality like that, you're going to use woods like chestnut, uh, cedar, mm -hmm. uh, spruce, fir. Up in Norway, spruce and fir were the big ones. And there was a, a, a type of Nordic uh, cedar as well, uh, a white cedar that they would use. Uh, this is some western red cedar, this churn, this incomplete butter churn. Um, but if you look closely at these, and I brought this chunk of wood to demonstrate um, and this is some western red cedar, but that's the quality of wood you need for, for good coopers. If you have knots that run through the wood, if you have twists in the grain of the wood, uh, you're going to have a much more difficult time cutting those nice crisp shapes to make a watertight vessel. If you have a joint that has a knot on it that tears out, that little tear will cause a leak. So a nice clean material. And, uh, and white oak is the densest, hardest wood of all the woods that, that coopers have available to them. Uh, cedar being probably the softest. Poplar, tulip poplar that grows around here is, is good for it too, but that tends to rot a lot faster. So, the, oh, my paper. so with coopering, and you saw the coopers in that images, uh, the Norwegian coopers, um, they're wearing leather aprons, and it's not so much to um, protect themselves from their sharp pools, because <laughs> if of an axe is sharp enough to cut through oak, it's going to be sharp enough to cut through yeah. So this is the protector clothes. And uh, historically, clove, cloth, was far more expensive than leather. So, um, so people would wear leather aprons or even have leather trousers that they um, would wear for when they're doing you know, really hard work because the leather can take it more than the cloth and the fabric can. So, and there was a tool that I was going to bring with me, a splitting pro, to split some of this material off from this piece of, uh, of cedar. But I forgot to bring it, so I'm gonna have to do it with the with the axe. But okay, so before I do that, <laughs> <laughs> so let me show you. This is a little demonstration bucket that I always bring, and sometimes I do this with a barrel, but too much tonight. But um, and this doesn't have a bottom in it, but I just want to kind of give you the idea where you notice how this is. It's narrower at the top. And it's yeah. wider at the base. And so anything, as I mentioned before, anything that a cooper makes is conical in form. And that's so that you can hold it together with these rings. So you have your, your hoop driver, which grips the edge of the hoops. And you have your cooper's hammer, which is usually around a two to three pound hammer. So much bigger than just a standard claw hammer. Because you really are driving those hoops, especially iron hoops, very hard down onto the, the conical form of the vessel. I have some wooden hoop vessels over here too. And wooden hoops were far more common because they were less expensive than iron. Iron has to be mined up from the ground and processed and smelted and finally rolled out or hammered out into these strips and then the cooper will smith the hoop to make the container. But wooden hoops grow up out of the ground ready to be used. So those were far more common really up until the mid 19th century. Did you make any of those? Uh, most of those I did make, but the ones that have the patina, they're kind of dark. Um, those are the antiques, and I think uh, most of those are uh, 19th century, maybe, maybe a couple 18th century pieces. What do you mean by they grow out of the ground? The saplings the you're taking young trees, they're only oh. maybe, some of them are like trees, yeah. uh, like hickories that are maybe 10 foot tall, and I just go out in the woods and cut them, and they're only uh -huh. about that big around, yeah. and then I split them in half and bend them while they're green, uh -huh. and then cut a scarf uh -huh. uh, to lock them together. And, uh, and I used, and I didn't, I wasn't trained how to do this during my apprenticeship because we didn't really have access to a lot of good saplings. But it's just basically you're tying that off, uh -huh. and then you have a scarf notch that locks it together. And so by studying a lot of these Norwegian vessels and a lot of these hoops had fallen off, I was able to take them apart and see how that notch was cut. And then I replicated it on my pieces. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in, there's coopering in Japan and China as well, and um, they'll use uh, woven bamboo for their wooden hoops. So let me, uh, now, I'm going to drive these hoops back off the barrel end. Right now, it's incredibly strong. A barrel, being like an egg shape, is probably the strongest wooden structure ever made by man. Uh, you have these floating joints in between the stays, but if you drive the rings back off, Yeah.
you have a, a rivet, then that only goes, that, that fastens or arrests the overlapping ends of the hoop, but that doesn't actually go into the wood at all. Mm. And so the, uh, the real skill of a cooper that you're learning from the apprenticeship is being able to shape that curvature and the taper and the bevel on all the pieces so they'll fit properly into your predetermined rims into your hoops. So do you number them so you well, know where they are? Uh, when you're first, when you're doing new work, and uh, you're raising up the container um, at the beginning of the process, you don't have to number them. They should be able to go in any order inside of the hoops. If you're making a circle, I mean, if you're making an oval container, then all that's out the window. They got each piece has to be right next to another. But, um, but when you're you making a new barrel hands, so or a new, all together. Uh, dairy bucket, they really do, they can go in any order inside of the hoops. Now, um, in the whaling industry, sometimes they would disassemble existing barrels uh, to save space on the outward uh, voyage of the, of the ship. And then as they harpooned whales and rendered out oil, they would reassemble those barrels as needed, and they would have to put them back in the same order they took out of the hoops for them to be watertight. Oh, wow. So Yay. it's a bit of a balancing act to get those pieces in there. So once you've done it a few times, it really, it really isn't that difficult. And then... And then the bottom will go in, will go in last. And I have uh, the groove that I've cut around the inside. That's what holds the bottom in place. So you'll uh, measure out usually two pieces or more, peg them together, and then cut them down to fit into that groove. Huh. So, so all the wineries now in, in Virginia, that are, are they using like wooden barrels to store their wine? Yeah, yeah. The barrel nowadays is no longer a shipping container or even really a storage container as much as it is a, um, a part of the recipe of making bourbon or wine or beer. You want the flavor from the wood and it sits in the barrel for a certain length of time uh, and the barrel's imparting color and flavor into the beverage. And um, but traditionally, the barrel was simply the shipping container and because it takes you know months to ship a barrel of wine from France to Virginia, it's going to pick up a lot of flavor from the wood. And when we stopped using wooden barrels to ship those containers to ship those goods in uh, the 20th century, late 19th century, 20th century, we realized, oh, we were missing the flavor from the wood. So now we've gone back to it, and it's extremely fashionable <coughs> to use oak barrels for all those. So let me um, let me clean up this. This is a, as I mentioned, this is a piece of western red cedar, and this this is going to be kind of messy here. Usually, I have a splitting tool that I use to just uh, split it off. The axe is also looks good, but I'm going to make kind of a mess here. <laughs> But because this is this is quarter split material, it's also pretty soft. But because there's no knots, there's no twists in it, it actually cleaves off, splits off quite quite easily. Just like that. Do you have all your original fingers? Oh yeah, all all ten fingers, all eleven toes. <laughs> And then uh, this is the primary tool of a cooper to do a lot of the, the rough work on a stave is an axe. So if I was going to turn this into a, uh, uh, a stave for a barrel, I'm going to take a look at it and then use the axe to chop. Barrel staves start off being straight and then they're wider in the middle and slightly tapered to both ends to create this shaped vessel before you bend all the pieces to make this shape. So the staves have to be shaped in that fashion with the axe first, and then refined with a draw knife and then a uh, joint plane, which is right behind me. So this is my portable chopping block. So in my shop at home, I have a chopping block that's actually bolted to the floor, so it's a little bit taller than this, so it's easier to work on. But um, could bring that. With me. So is that an antique axe? Yeah, this is a 19th century axe. Wow. Yeah, most wow. of my tools are 19th century and a few are 18th century. I think wow. this, this crows here, which I use to cut the groove for the bottom to fit into, is a 18th century tool. And I've, I've been collecting these 
over the past 20 years. And then um, uh, the master cooper who taught me, uh, Jim Pettengill, when he retired uh, from Colonel Williamsburg, he had brought his set of tools with him from England, and he gave me all of those. So, in fact, that's his point. That's his point. But I, I use a combination of antique tools that uh, have been given to me or I've found in uh, antique stores or on eBay. Um, and, um, and then I've also had some tools reproduced by uh, some blacksmiths uh, that work at Cornwallsburg. Where is the coopering area at uh, Colonial Williamsburg? Um, the George Whip House, it's now behind the George Whip House on okay. the premises there. And I'll, and I'll say, I worked there for 15 years, and then I actually left uh, for seven years and pursued my, my own business as a, um, a traveling trooper. I traveled quite a bit and did a lot of work for different museums and national parks and traveled overseas. And, uh, and now, I've actually just gone back to Colonial Williamsburg, so I missed museum work. And uh, I didn't. I went back to Colonial Winsford, but I didn't go back to the Cooper. I went back uh, as a farmer now, so which is really getting back to my roots. Cause I grew up on a sheep farm in, in uh, Michigan. Mm. So you can see how the the state kind of has. It's slightly wider in the middle, and then it's slightly tapered at the ends. Uh, and you're doing that just with it's, your it's by, eyes. Yeah, by eye. And a lot of the measuring is done strictly by eye, because once you've gone through your apprenticeship, through your, your training, um, it's, we oh, would, for uh, making you know, boats, right? that um, tool there, historical yeah, tools, that traditional tools, mm -hmm. it's one of the fastest ways of producing a, one of these containers in a bucket, um, the size of, you know, I have over there, or even here, which should take about an hour. A, uh, a barrel this size, if you're doing production work with hand tools, should maybe take three hours. So now the uh, the next tool, I mean, is a, a draw bench. I'm sitting on a tool called a draw bench, which is basically just a foot operated vice, and that's all the draw bench does. I just clamp the piece of wood in place when I put my foot on the pedal here. But then that frees up both of my hands to use a draw knife, and it's named so because you're drawing it towards yourself as you're shaping the material. <laughs> And again, this is some pretty soft material. Learning how to sharpen your knives is also part of the apprenticeship. For any woodworking trade, you're being taught how to sharpen your tools to achieve the, the cuts that you need to achieve for that trade. So uh, your next presentation, is it is it next week with Corey last time? Yeah. Next week? No, next month. Next, month. next month. Next month? So he's a cabinet maker. So Corey and I are, have been friends for a really long time. Oh, yeah. And um, the Cooper shop used to be right across the street from the cabinet maker. So I'd go down there on my lunch break and harass all the cabinet makers all the time. <laughs> and they'd come up and harass me at the Cooper shop. And um, But that's one of the things I noticed is that um, different woodworkers have different edges on the blades of their tools to achieve different kinds of cuts. And in some cases, the cabinet makers have really fine edges that um, would dull very quickly, or I could even damage them when I'm when I'm chopping on very hard oak. So, um, so the the means by which we sharpened our tools was in some cases very different than what the cabinet makers do. And he might consider my edge fairly well, not really dull, but uh, duller than what he would need if he was doing intricate carving on a, a harpsichord or on a on a table or on legs of a chair. Did you find um, a piece of that in Norway similar? This piece of wood? No. Oh, but, draw knives? Yeah. They were everywhere. Really? Yeah, they were everywhere. In that collection at the Norsk um, Folk Museum, they had piles of these. They had piles of these. They had piles of those. Oh, and the croses right. that they were using were very different than the English style. Uh, and they were more conducive to making really small, tiny containers, little drinking vessels. So I made uh, a couple of tankards over there that were based on an original tankard from the 18th century. Yeah, that one. And the one with the wooden hoops on it. The original had wooden hoops, so I made one with wooden hoops on it, too. But, um, but yeah, they had uh, piles of, of, of tools. And they looked like I could have just picked them up and started using them. And the, the, the edges were still sharp. It was... Did you ever work on a bowl? Hmm? 
No, not, not with this. I know. The, the only time I ever, I'm concerned about that kind of thing, and, and I have my shop and I'm using a lot of antique tools, but I'll, uh, I do have some electric tools, like a bandsaw, an electric joiner, oh, when I'm doing a serial prep. <laughs> and so when I'm working with that stuff, I take precautions. And ear protection, uh, eye protection, all that, all that stuff. What does all that good wood on the floor? You don't want to take it home to start, yeah, it's, start uh, with uh, fire. I mean, yeah. that image uh, with the Norwegian coopers, I mean, there's mountains of shavings. And a cooper shop, and you can see, I only, I've only been carving for a few minutes, and I'm, I mean, you've got piles and piles and piles of shavings. And what do you do with this? Um, in, in a lot of cases, I mean, it's got to be burned up. It becomes uh, an incredible fire hazard. Uh, because you're working with very dry material, and if somebody dropped a candle or a lantern in here, it would burn very, very quickly. So fire was a, a very serious hazard. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'll show you one more, I have one more knife, another, um, a, another draw knife, a hollowing knife for cutting the inside furniture. Actually, let me level yeah. this surface. And, then, oh, and can you smell? Does, can you smell yeah, yeah. the uh, cedar? The cedar. Yeah. It's, uh, to me, it's, I'm kind of desensitized to it, so I don't smell it that much, but when I do smell it, it smells like pickles. It's smelling pickles. It smells like cedar. It smells like cedar. It could be more of a vinegar. I promise I'll clean all the So and I could have, if I brought the, the fro, the spleen tool, I could have done all that in one, like a couple of splits, but would have saved all that shading. But, um, but now I'll get the, the hollowing knife. So you have the, the exterior curvature, which you cut with that flat draw knife. And then you have the interior curvature, which is cut with uh, this curved draw knife, a hollowing knife. That's over there. And that's a head up. Um, one of my blacksmith friends at Clowensburg uh, make this for me. So each individual stave, when you're shaping it, should really only take just a matter of minutes to shape. Yeah. Well. To, nowadays, that's exactly right, yeah. Back then, when you have really uh, ancient forests that, um, that have never been cut down, most of the trees would grow in this quality. So as a sapling that grows in a very dense forest, the tree has to grow straight up without branching out until it gets to the top of the canopy of the forest. And so the trunk is perfectly clear and straight. So uh, nowadays, most forests don't, it's, you know, it's fifth and sixth growth, second growth. And the trees, when they come up, they don't have a lot of competition, so they branch out to get to the light. So mature forests produce that quality of timber, whether it's oak or poplar or cedar or whatever. So, so that's how you're hollowing the inside, which in some cases isn't always necessary, but it does complete the volume of a barrel, and it also makes it easier to bend the staves of a barrel using heat and fire. And you'll burn some of the shavings to light a fire inside the cast to warm it up so you can drive rings down on the splayed end to bend all those pieces into the barrel shape. So that's the hollowing knife. And then uh, the last one, well, this is the last one. It's all energy, she's gonna use it, it's still not wasted. Yeah, yeah well, uh, you only end up burning a fraction of the shavings that you, you make uh, for the trussing. So, and um, <coughs> you'd probably end up maybe selling them to, or taking them home to your family so you can start your fires, your cook fires. Uh, evenings, mornings, and evenings. And then the joiner plane, uh, this, is, this completes the shaping of the stage. It's a large block plane that you're running the stave across, across this blade that's very, very fine. But this is how you're cutting a nice flat surface. And this, I rough this out with the axe. So I'm doing as little work as possible on the joiner because this is taking so little material away with each strike. And then I'll run my finger across that to feel for any ridges or imperfections. So you see, you can see the rough surface here, and then the fine surface. Oh my goodness! 
So then that's that's what I just planned right there. Oh, spool is filled. <laughs> So that's that's about it. I know. I don't, do you guys have any questions? You know, open it up for you questions. You know, it's funny you should say that. I got that piece of wood. From home. <laughs> and in most cases, I absolutely do not go to Lowe's or Home Depot to get the wood. But the, the Western Red Cedar, they've been selling it as fence rails, and it, uh, it's coming all the way from the West Coast, and it's it's some of the most beautiful wood I've ever worked with, um, but that's the exception to the rule, right? It's, it's very hard to find wood in that Most of the time, um, especially when it comes to oak, um, I, I'm driving around my neighborhood or the county, James City County, and I look for people who are cutting down trees in their yard, or if a hurricane goes through and blows down trees, I'll go and knock on people's door if I see a tree that I think looks good, and I ask them if I can have it or if I can buy it. And they usually like, yeah, get it out of here, just get it out of here. And then I bring my splitting tools and I split up the pieces and put it in the back of my van. Did you Yeah, pine does work, and white pine is, a, is very good. Um, yellow pine was used for cooperage for like um, tar and turpentine barrels, but it's it's very very resinous and it dulls your tools very very quickly. So I've I've made some things out of long leaf yellow pine, but I will never do it again because I, always, I made one little bucket and then I had to sharpen all my tools again. After. Yeah, even oak, which is one of the harder woods, doesn't dull my tools nearly as fast as the pine. Is that a white pine or a yellow pine? Yellow, yellow pine. Yeah, um, well, it, it's long and yellow pine is fantastic, and it has a lot of uses, and that's, it's not a lot of around me for that reason. And um, but it can produce beautiful quality materials, but very resinous. Yeah. Marshall, I think you have a Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh,